Oh, God is a choir has just sung. Amazing, amazing love. You who are our God should die for us. Why? Why? And then that you should bid us follow you. Show us how. These few moments we have, show us how. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you remember when you were a kid in Sabbath school and the teacher just stood up in front of you and she said, all right, boys and girls, usually a she, it can be a he, stood up in front of you and said, all right, boys and girls, watch my hands. And everybody's watching the teacher's hands. And she took her fingers and she went like this. You remember that? She went like this. And then she closed her hand into a kind of a double-sized fist. And she said to you, here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors. Oh, where are all the people? Oh, and as a little boy and as a little girl, you say, oh, that is something what my teacher can do. And then she said, watch this, boys and girls. Just watch this. And we didn't know, but she's putting her hand together differently. And she says, all right, we'll make that church again. Here we go. Here is the church. Here is the steeple. Open the doors. Look at all the people. Wow. And the whole place just goes electric. <laughs> Does it still bless your soul? Yeah. You know what? I, don't you wish that the, that the truth about the church could be that simple? But as it turns out, there are two competing theories for the church. And they have all to do with where the teacher's fingers are. Two competing theories. I want to run them by you. Check it out. See if you, see if you agree. Let's call the first theory, theory number one, the church as a field. Put it on the screen, please. Church as a field. Now, do you notice the direction the arrows are pointing in theory number one? Yeah, which direction are they pointing? They're all pointing in, 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 in. Everything's inside the church. Here is the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. Ooh, there are all the people. See, that's, that's that theory, the church as a field. Suggesting that if you, get enough, if you get enough people inside these four walls, the kingdom of heaven can really, can really go into, go into high drive mission. I mean, this is the church, the church of the field theory that makes having the very best choir on earth as we had today, your choir. Having the coolest preaching, having the hottest youth group, having the funnest Sabbath school classes, because you got to get everybody in. You have to get them in. The church as a field looks to the church within these walls as the dramatic stage for the kingdom salvation mission. Hey, listen, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having, there's nothing wrong at all with having a wonderful choir. There's nothing wrong with having a thoughtful preacher. There's nothing wrong with having a youth group that's really gung-ho or Sabbath schools that are fun. But, well, there's a second theory. Let me share it with you. So this is the first theory. The church is a field. Here's the second theory. I put it on the screen for you. The contradistinction is immediately clear to you by the direction of the arrows. Have you noticed? The arrows in the field, everything's coming here. Where do the, arrow, where, where do the arrows go now? Everything is out. The church as a force. And what's the point of the church as a force? You're moving away from the church. This theory suggests that the real life and mission of the church is not built around the one hour, two hours, maybe three hours max that you may spend within the four walls of the church. No, 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 no. The, the church as a force is a theory that suggests it's, what's ha it's what happens when we leave this place for plus six days. That's the kingdom mission. That's the kingdom business. And that's how God advances his cause on earth. Now, don't get, me, don't get me wrong, again, there's nothing wrong with the choir in the church as a force. There's nothing wrong with the preaching or the youth group or the Sabbath school, but the emphasis is not here, it's out there. In fact, the church as a force theory declares that the church is not the field and that, in fact, the world is the field which is precisely the point Jesus is making on that unforgettable outdoor church because you couldn't find a church big enough to hold the crowds when Jesus got up to teach and preach. So he's sitting in a little boat and he's bobbing up and down. It's one of those, can you hear me now without a PA moment as the crowd lines up along the rocky shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I want to go there with you. Open your Bible with me, please, to Matthew chapter 13. Picture is set up here in chapter 13. You didn't bring a Bible. You got your, your uh, smartphone with you. You have it there. 
Grab a pew Bible if you don't have a Bible. I'd love to you, to you to see this right in front of you here. Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to be in the New International Version. And I see some ushers coming through line. They're saying, hey, would you like a study guide? You want a study guide because it has some cool quotes in it, but there's nothing to fill in today. No fill in the blanks today, so don't feel bad if you don't see a blank up there. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, that same day Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. And then he told them many things in parables. So this outdoor church, he starts telling stories. Now, we're going to skip the first story because everybody knows it. But the stunning and dramatic second story, we're not going to skip. Drop down to verse 24. And then Jesus told them another parable. Here we go now. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. We're talking about a farmer here, folks. We're talking about a very wise and good farmer. And he sows good seed in his field. But, verse 25, while everyone was sleeping, his enemy, ooh, it has to be a jealous farmer. It has to be some envious farmer nearby that doesn't like the way that this farmer is so good at growing his crops. And in the middle of the night, while Farmer Brown is sound asleep in all his hired hands, an enemy comes and sows weeds among the wheat. And then the enemy goes away. Verse 26, and when the wheat sprouted, hey, wait a minute, that can't be tomorrow. No, that can't be next week. No, this is probably a month or two later. When the wheat wheat finally sprouts and there's a little growth at the head, the servants come racing into the farmhouse one day. <sighs> Master, you're not going to believe this, but your field has weeds in it. He said, what's the big deal about weeds? We always have weeds. Would what, you find a little, little collection of weeds somewhere? No, 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 Master. No, everywhere. It's as, if, it's as if it would just evenly spread out the entire field. You can't be serious. I am. Bah. I know who did this. Verse 28, an enemy did this, he replied. The servant said, okay, we'll help you. We'll go out. We'll pull up all the weeds, all the, all the tares, all the darnels. We'll just pull them all up. No, 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 no. You're not going to pull them up. Look, at if you pull the weeds up, you're going to pull the weed up. I can't afford to lose one sprout of wheat. So here's the deal. Verse 29. Now, verse 30. Let's drive down to verse 30. Let both the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now, that was such, that was such a dramatic story. And the disciples are so puzzled by it that the moment Jesus gets out of the boat and goes back into town, turn the page, they come straight to him. This is verse 36. The, the disciples come up to him and they say, Lord, Lord, Lord. What is it, 36? And he left the crowd and he went into the house and his disciples came to him and said, please explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. What in the world were you trying to say? Jesus says, hey, simple. Listen, guys, here it is. Verse 37, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus' favorite title for himself. It's the only one he uses, son of man. That's me sowing the good seed. And the field is the What? The field is the word, the world. It's not the church. No, 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 no. The field is the world. Jesus agrees. The church is a force. The field is, a, is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom, and the weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy, you probably already guessed this, Jesus said to the disciples. The enemy who sows them is, guess who? It's the devil, of course. Evil with a D. It's the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. And as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Wow. What's the point of this parable? What's the point of this parable, Dwight? I'll tell you what the point of the parable is. Jesus does the weeding. Did you notice? It doesn't happen until the end of the age. And it's his angels that go out and do it. Isn't that right? Jesus does the the weeding. Leave the weeding of the field to him. Let me put it another way. It is not the mission of the church to weed the field. Jesus says, no, 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 no. My angels, they'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Why? Because it's not the mission of the church to weed the field. It's the mission of the church to love the field. That's our mission. Let me put it, let me repeat it, please. The mission of the church is to love people to Jesus, not to weed people from Jesus. Come on, think, think, think. You got to leave the weeding then? You got to leave it to the kingdom. Let the people that run the kingdom take care of it. That's not your job. 
In fact, Jesus, to make the point clear, he says, let me just reemphasize that point because you guys are not getting it. And you drop down, he tells another story, verse 47, and once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was less, let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore, and then they sat down and collected the good fishing baskets and threw the bad away. This is how it will be. Here it comes, the punchline all over again. This is how it will be. At the end of the age, the angels will come down, and they'll do the separating. Good fish, bad fish, bad fish, good fish, good fish, good fish, good fish, bad fish. They'll do the separating. So far, are we together? Yeah. And what's the point of the parable of the good and the bad fish? What's the point of the parable of the, of the, of the weeds and the wheat? Leave the weeding of the field. Leave the sorting of the fish to Jesus. Leave it all to him. And have you noticed when the weeding and the sorting comes, by the way? When does the weeding and the sorting come in both of them? When does it come? At the end of the age. That's the return of Christ. That's the end of human history as we know it. So by the way, that means that if you consider it your job in the church, your personal mission, self-called, self of course, is to identify people that need to be outside the church, not inside the church, that means that you have to wait till the last second of human history and do it then. You can't do it now. Either way, the weeding is his. The sorting, the sorting is his mission. Why? Because you and I may make a very sad mistake. That's why we may throw a fish out that was ready to be a good fish and it just looked like a bad fish. We may pull up a plant that turns out it was a wheat. It was not weed. We can mess up. I want to read a dynamite little line. I put it on the screen for you. It's from the classic Christ Object Lessons, kind of commenting on this parable, the, the wheat and the weed. Put that line up, please. Christ has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. Isn't that something? I was having Bible studies once with a young man. He ran in, in, with, a, with a fast crowd. In fact, he was living with his girlfriend. We were having Bible studies. He started coming to church. And then one day, the electric company turned off his electric turned off his electricity. Failure to pay. It can happen. A few days went by, and finally, finally that young man said, you know, this is crazy. I need that electricity. He climbed up the, he climbed up the pole and said, I'll put it back together. He grabbed the wrong wire, electrocuted. His family came to me and said, Pastor, would you conduct his funeral? I have no idea what that young man was thinking that day when he tried to reconnect his house. All I know is that God loved him. And I'm going to love him in life, and I'm going to love him in death. Let's go back to that Christ object lesson. Let's keep reading. Christ has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to you and me. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we're supposed to be spurious? That means fake. There's been a lot of fake in uh, the public conversation of America these days. This is fake Christians. These are fake Christians. Church, church says, we're gonna, we're gonna, we, they've got to be fake Christians. Throw them out. We would be sure, she goes on, we would be sure to make mistakes. Keep reading. Oh, this is something. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. Did you not know? What were you thinking? Hey, time out. Who are the people that you think are hopeless? Who are the people you think are hopeless? Would it be an alcoholic? I mean, we're talking alcoholic to the very DNA of his bones. Would it be somebody, uh, this, this opioid addiction that is a kind of the number one health crisis in the United States right now? And by the way, Time Magazine just last week came out with something I've never seen in all its history, and that is a black and white issue, black and white photographs of one photographer who chronicles with his camera the, the drug, the opioid epidemic in America. Not a single ad in that entire, not a single ad. That's how serious... It is. Maybe it's one of those opioid addicts. Well, it's not gonna, no, that, that's hopeless, trust me. Hopeless subjects. How about those addicted to sex? Sex in any form you wish. Call it up. You can, we don't have enough time to call up the different forms. Any form of sex, sex that's deviant, it's what you consider to be blatantly immoral. Those kinds of people obviously are hopeless subjects, right? Pedophile. How about a pedophile? How about an abuser? We've been hearing a lot of talk lately about abusers. How about an abuser? A hopeless subject. The man with his fourth wife. The wife with her fifth husband. You see, the reality is we morally marginalize people in our minds. 
And when we marginalize them, we also ostracize them. Not in here. Not in here, do you understand? And isn't that something? All the while we are cutting them off, Christ is trying to draw them in. All the while we are pushing them out, he say, come on. He's trying to drag them, pull them in. Put that line up again, please. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. Listen, listen, Pastor. Dwight, listen. We can't love people. I mean, you, you just can't have people like that in here. What are they going to think about this church? They're going to make some conclusions about us, and it's not right. No. Nope. They've had all the chances they need. Those kind of people do not belong in here. I've got to tell you, and that's why I've been moved by the compelling thrust of Jerry Cook's book, Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness, to the place I'm dreaming now. No, I'm praying now that the church I belong to might one day become known far and wide as a people who are like Jesus, a people who love, a people who accept, a people who forgive, no matter who, no matter what, no matter where, no matter why. They just love, accept, and forgive. I keep dreaming and praying that the church one day, this church might become a safe haven for other sinners like you and me. Or maybe not so much like you and me. Sinners that Jesus loved out of their pain, loved out of their guilt. Boy, look at Jesus. I mean, please. What was that line we just read? Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. And you want to talk about Zacchaeus the cheat, the public embezzler? Come on in. You want to talk about Mary Magdalene, the whore? Seven times so deep that addiction, seven times demons are cast out of her. You want to talk about the thief on the cross? Come on in. You want to talk about, who do you want to talk about? You want to talk about the secret abuser because those are usually the case. That's the, usually the case for abusers. They do it secretly. You want to talk about the guilty Pharisee named Simon who was an abuser. And Jesus knew. You want to talk about the loud mouth braggioso Peter the denier? You want to, about, want to talk about the cool executive Judas? Takes them all. And you know what the common bond is between all these names I've just mes- mentioned? Here's the common bond. To a man, a, to a woman, to a person, they, they were loved, accepted, and forgiven by Jesus. Even when they didn't ask for it, they were forgiven. My, oh, my. They could feel the love. Isn't it amazing how Jesus loved the people we, n- we normally marginalize and ostracize? If you feel like you're one of these sinners right now, I want you to say, I got some good news for you. Just look at the way Jesus treats sinners. I'm sorry about the way the church treats sinners sometimes, but I want you to look at Jesus right now and notice how he treats sinners. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I offer that to you. Come follow me. Come on. Let's go. I got a church big enough for you. Wow. Even Judas... Desire of Ages says that on that fateful night, just hours before Jesus would be executed, because Judas will betray him in a, in a few, couple, three hours, Desire of Ages tells us that when the, when the callous but gentle hands of the master reached down to scrub the dusty feet of Judas, his heart thrilled. He can feel the love. He is known in this, he, he knows in this nefarious dark moment that's about to unfold that he is still being loved by the Jesus he's going to sell for 30 pieces of silver. He felt the love. Can you feel the love around here with you and with me? Can you feel the love? The truth is, The church of Jesus Christ back then was filled with moral wrecks like you and me, and it still is because of you and me. Keep reading. On the screen again, Christ has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust his work to you and me. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious or fake Christians? We should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. Now notice, she goes on. Here we go. Were we to deal with these souls according to our imperfect judgment, it would perhaps extinguish their last hope. The fact that they are here is the last hope God has. And you're going to extinguish it? At what price? For what cause? 
the purity of the church. The moment you joined the church, it was no longer pure. And that's true for me too. Many, she goes on, Ellen White, many who think themselves Christians will at last be found wanting. And many will be in heaven who their neighbors suppose would never enter there. Why? Because we judge from appearance, but God judges, God judges the heart. Someone has said that when you get to heaven, there'll be three surprises. Surprise number one, there'll be people there you never thought would be there. Surprise number two, there'll be people missing that you thought for sure would be there. And surprise number three, you're there. Often we regard, as, we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself, which is precisely why it is not the mission of the church to weed the field. It's the mission of the church to love the field. We've not been called to weed people out. We've been called to, to love people in. Six days, seven days a week. If only we could be that kind of people. If only we could be a people that would make the three minimal guarantees I'm thinking Jerry Cook again. I'll put his words one more time on the screen for you. The minimal guarantee we, we must make to people in or out of the church is that they will be loved always, under every circumstance, with no exception. The second guarantee is that they will be totally accepted without reservation. The third thing we must guarantee is that no matter how miserably they fail or how blatantly they sin, unreserved forgiveness is theirs for the asking with no bitter taste left in anybody's mouth. And finally... A church that can make that commitment to every person is a church that's learning to love and a church that will be a force for God, end quote. There it is, what Jerry Cook calls the theory of the church as a force. A force for what? A force for good. A force for God. A force, force for grace. A force for love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Do you understand that the church is the most powerful institution on this planet, bar none, to live out the love of God? It is divine love that makes the church the most significant and influential body of human beings anywhere on the planet. Not a university, not a hospital. The most powerful force on this planet is the local church. You're the church. I'm the church. When we go through these doors in just a few moments, there goes the church. Three hours, an hour here. Six plus days out there, there goes the church. Here they come. Look out, world. That's the church as a force theory. But I'll make, the, I'll make the guarantee to you, this is my minimal guarantee to you, that if you walk through these doors, if you walk through these doors, I guarantee you that I will love you without reservation. I will accept you without conditions. And I will forgive you. You want to be forgiven? I will forgive you, no matter what. You walk through, this, you walk through these doors. That's, that's our minimum guarantee to you as a people. The moment I walk out these doors, by the way, any human being I meet, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, up to our knees in mud, together, the guarantee is I love you. I accept you. I don't care what you've done, I forgive you. Some people think this is cheap grace and you're just kind of, kind of letting people off the hook too easy. The problem is we've been keeping people on the hook for so long they don't know what to do with the church. It's time to let them off the hook. We're not hook fishing. We're loving as a force. We're loving as a force. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Put it on the screen, the church has been raised up to be the greatest force for divine love anywhere on this planet. The question is, can you feel the love around here? That's the question. I was praying this last Wednesday morning. Woke up early, way too early. <sighs> Couldn't go back to sleep, and that's what I'm doing now. If I can't get back to sleep, I say, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and count sheep. I'll talk to God. So I go down there in the dark. And you know what? It's just all of a sudden, man, it's just like it's just, pff, this burden on my heart. And I'm wrestling with God over what's it going to take? What's it going to take? What's it going to take for this church, this congregation? What's it going to take for this university? What is it going to take? Because the truth of the matter is, I'll be really honest with you, I'm not naive. I know that you, the preacher can't preach nothing 
diddly squat into you. He can't even preach it into himself. So all this call about loving our neighbors and all this call about being baptized daily by the Holy Spirit, I understand that. I'm preaching until I'm blue in the face, but it doesn't matter. The preacher can't pull it off. And every preacher will eventually learn that lesson. You can't. You have to have, you have, to have intervention. What kind of intervention are you talking about, Dwight? I'm talking about the intervention that happens when the personal representative of Jesus Christ himself shows up, shows up, shows up wherever it is you pray. I hope you have the same place you go to. Don't just be doing eeny, meeny, miny, mo every day. You're terribly confusing for your mind because it always is trying to understand what's the setting we're in now. You need to go back to the same place. If it's a dormitory room, it's the same place. If it's a trailer park, it's the same place. If it's an apartment, it's the same place. Go back to the same place. And when you're there without distraction, alone with God, the whole, that's where the personal representative of Christ himself shows up. He's called, the, he's called the comforter. He's not your enemy. Eugene Peterson calls him your friend, the friend. He's the advocate. He's your defender. He is on your side to the max. When he shows up, here's all you do. You just say, hey, Holy Spirit, you got to fill me. I can't feel myself. Okay, I understand all of this, but I just can't feel myself. That's it. I wish there was some kind of cool secret. I wish there was some kind of rocket science that we could tap into here. It's not. It's just plain. It's simple. You ask me. Let me, let me, let me feel you today. The whole point is to come back tomorrow and ask again. And come back tomorrow and ask again. Today, today, today. Just keep getting filled. That's the point. You know what? At some point, this thing has to turn. This thing has to turn practical. And by I mean, what, but what I mean by practical is, you got to be able to walk out of wherever it is you have prayer, walk back into the world, and start looking for a chance to do something to show that you care for somebody. I don't care who the somebody is. You just walk out of your dormitory room and back onto the campus, and I'm going to find somebody today that I can care for. That's it. It's just no big deal. Holy Spirit, waken me. Let me know. And by the way, the opportunities come in, in just innocuous, very subtle ways. Somebody may come up to you and say, hey, can you spot me five? What are you talking about? I need five bucks. There will be an instant flash within you that says, okay, you got five. You happen to have five today. Give it to them. I have a friend who said, Dwight, you need to get a book. And so I went and got the book because he read it. He said, it really blessed me. So I went and got the book. It's written by, it's written by a, 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 a businessman in Grand Rapids, Michigan, of all places, just up the interstate. His name is Claire de Graaf, a good Dutch name for Grand Rapids. And this very successful businessman has written a book. I'll put the, it's in your study guide. Uh, the title of the book is The 10-Second Rule. Do you want to know what the 10-Second Rule is? Here it is reduced to a single sentence. The 10-Second Rule, just do the next thing you're reasonably certain Jesus wants you to do and do it within the next 10 seconds. That's it. Because you are bright enough to know, and so am I, that if I take a little time to say, ah, I don't know, the guy's standing at the high, on the corner of the street, and he's saying, need food, have children, can you help? I see that's, uh, this guy's a pro. I'm telling you, he's a pro. These guys do this for a living. They're rich, they're wealthier than me. I got, well, why would I want to give money and feed his bad habits? You give yourself more than 10 seconds, and it's over, because your bright mind will tell you all the logical reasons why you should not be unselfish right now. You should not help anybody. Take care of what you got. Hang on to it, boy. You can't, you can't let it go. That's his point. Just respond, okay, I'll do it. 10 seconds, or your mind will talk itself out. You see, the problem of the human race is selfishness. So I'm studying, do anybody study the Sabbath school lesson anymore? So my friend John Matthews has written the Sabbath school lesson for this quarter. It's dynamite stuff. And I ripped this out. Look at this week. This is, what is this? This is Wednesday. Oh, boy, did he get it right here. Listen to this. Whatever your motive for giving may be, it is on a continuum that ranges from ego to altruism. You're either given to be seen or you're really the little widow down here and just giving it because Jesus said, give me everything you have, and you give it. So somewhere you're, isn't that right? Come on, it's for all of us. The fight on this continuum between selfishness and giving is fought more frequently than any other spiritual fight on earth. That's our biggest battle. 
I'm telling you, you can be, you can be 13, 14, you can be 17, 18. It doesn't matter. It's the same battle. It's the same struggle. Shall I let it go or shall I hang on to it? Somebody needs me now, but shall I give? The whole human race, this is, this is a numero uno battle on earth. It's a battle for selfishness. Isn't that something? And what he put here? Oh, the bottom line comes down to one word, love. You go, John. Love. And love cannot be manifested without self-denial, a willingness to give, to give of oneself, even sacrificially, for the good of others. That's how you do it. You just do it. You just do it. The Holy Spirit says, do it, and you do it. And every time you do it, that unselfish muscle gets stronger and stronger, and finally in an arm wrestle, it can put the selfish muscle down just like that. And I can tell you people that I know and love in this very space who have now a very strong, unselfish muscle. Doesn't matter what the car, there they are. And they're not wealthy. They're unselfish. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness comes through the Holy Spirit. Oh, by the way, I need to say this before I sit down. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness, do you know what, moms and dads? Let me talk to the moms and dads here for a moment. It applies to your children. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Even when you're going through hell with that child, it applies so that you will love that child, you will accept that child, you will forgive that child, no matter what the child has done. You can't control the child. Have you finally figured that out? It's over. But you love that child, you accept that child, and you forgive that child. Only the Holy Spirit can give you that. Some of you parents have been through, been through nightmares. I was talking with a fellow dad the other day, and he said, oh, you can't believe it. I said, no, I can believe it. Been there and done that. And, oh, by the way, are you a child? Are you a child? Do you have parents? You can flip it around. You can teach... Treat your parents in the same way. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness for your parents. doesn't matter what your daddy has done to you, what your mother has done or not done. You love that parent. You accept that parent. You forgive that parent no matter what. Dwight, are you saying that this abuse that I've been suffering, I somehow must remain in that abuse? Are you kidding? Forgiveness is not com com being complicit. Forgiveness is not giving permission. But forgiveness can be a tough love that stands up and says, enough of this, and you talk to somebody, girl. You talk to somebody, boy. You talk to somebody you respect and trust, and you get help. I'm not telling you to stay there and be ruined. Do you understand? But I am saying you must love your, you must love your father and mother. You must accept your father and mother. You must forgive your father and mother, and God will take care of you. But it's all through the Holy Spirit. The only the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. It's the Holy Spirit that can pull this off. The pledge we are about to take. No, the pledge I'm about to invite you to take. Go to the bottom of your study guide, please, and look at it. The pledge. We, I want to read that pledge to you right now, and then I'll sit down. The pledge. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit can we make a pledge like this. I'm praying that you would be willing to make the pledge. I am making the pledge. I'm telling you with you. Let's look at the pledge. You see it there? We'll put it up on the screen for you. The pledge. I make this commitment to you, and then there is a fill in the blank. You can put anybody in that blank you wish. Every day, it may be somebody else. It may be your roommate. It may be your parent. It may be your spouse. It may be your child. It may be the stranger you just met. It may be the visitor that walks into your church. It may be your office colleagues. It may be your enemy. You put your enemy's name in that spot. Somebody deserves this pledge from you. Okay, let's read. The, you see the pledge on the screen here. I make this commitment to you, blank. I will love you always under every circumstance with no exception. I will accept you totally and without reservation. And no matter how miserably you fail or how blatantly you sin, I offer unreserved forgiveness to you for the asking. I choose to love you as Jesus loves me. And then you sign it. And you keep it. You're not turning this in. You keep it. You keep it. Let's read it out loud together. You read off the screen or your study guide, and I'll read it right here in my notes. Out loud together. Everybody reading. I make this commitment to you. I will love you always under every circumstance with no exception. I will accept you totally and without reservation. And no matter how miserably you fail or how blatantly you sin, I offer unreserved forgiveness to you for the asking. 
I choose to love you as Jesus loves me. Signature. The pledge. It's time. It is time for this church to turn a corner. It is time for this people to become a force on this planet. And the only force that wins in this battle is the force of divine love. That's the only force that wins. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. The fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we're needing to make constant upgrades to our technology. So if God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Not a single penny of your donation will go to me. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website, newperceptions.tv, or call the number, you know the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. And may the God who has blessed you continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.